everyone. So we're going to get started. I'm told everybody is out of the hallway, even though we've been delaying everything here a bit. But um, so how to measure your Gradle DX. So first of all, who am I? Um, my name is Janelle Klein. I'm a developer, consultant, and CTO at New Iron. My uh, development background is specialized in, in uh, statistical process control systems and supply chain optimization from the lean manufacturing world. So I'm very much a data geek. And my consulting work has been in continuous delivery infrastructure, test automation strategy, technical mentorship. I just finished this book I've been working on for like five years now, like a few weeks ago. So that's pretty awesome. Then I'm also founder of Open Mastery, um, no fluff tour speaker, and a big Gradle fan, which is why I've been here the last three years. So uh, what is this talk about? So uh, this talk is about what I'm calling uh, OpenDX, an open standard for measuring the pain in software development. So this is a specification for data collection. And why does this matter? So imagine we, you wrote this uh, awesome plugin. And it's got you know, high code coverage, low cyclomatic complexity, all those good things, right? And then I try to use your awesome plugin. But I don't have such an awesome experience. So usability problems kind of roll downhill. And we can both be looking at the exact same code and have a totally different experience. But what if I measured my pain and then gave you that experience as feedback? Then you saw that and you're like, OK, I can fix that. And then you optimize the developer experience. And then I gave you feedback on the new experience and then, you know, now we've got a data-driven feedback loop for learning our way to awesome, right? So the other challenge at a, at a bigger level is, is that 90% of our software these days is built from existing parts and third-party components. So we have the same challenge at a bigger level. And, and you've got components that have usability problems. And that pain kind of rolls downhill, right? So that software has kind of become the new form of environment pollution. And we've got this kind of shared dumping ground of, of, of crappy software out there. And it's really hard to tell you know, what stuff is good, what stuff sucks, what stuff needs you know, some love out there. But we've always got this hard constraint of our human limitations and what we can handle. And as the complexity keeps increasing, and we don't have a way to manage and design for that, it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem in our industry. So what if we started measuring pain across the software supply chain? And you know, raising alerts about the things that are causing the most pain in the industry. And we could create pressure for better usability across the software supply chain. So then you know, everything is awesome, right? So what I wanted to propose today is a community experiment for measuring DX inside the Gradle ecosystem. So we're already seeing um, problems start to snowball in the uh, plugin ecosystem because we have no visibility that you know, gives us that what's what to tell us you know, what things need improvement, what things people are having problem with. It's all kind of you know, a, a bunch of stuff that we um, I think could use a lot of improvement and love um, from the community. So everything I'm going to be showing today is very much in the realm of uh, emergent practice. So as I mentioned, I just finished my book. I've been uh, uh, working on solidifying these methods just like with my team and consulting projects. So this is like first time it's been kind of out in the wild. And so my goal uh, today is to show you what's possible once we have visibility and then start a conversation in our community on, on how we can start solving and tackling these really hard challenges in our industry. So how do we measure pain? So for this to make sense, I need to kind of tell you where all these ideas came from. So about eight years ago, I was working on this project with this really great team. We're disciplined with best practice. It's um, constantly working on improvements, you know, CI, unit testing, all that great stuff. But despite all these things, I watched my project hit a wall. And by hit a wall, I mean we brought down production three times in a row and then didn't ship again for another year. And so we got in the retrospective and we're like, well, what are we supposed to do? We're doing all the right stuff, right? So one of my teammates said, well, if we don't understand a problem, we should collect data. 
So we started thinking, well, what data would help us understand the problems? And so I thought the main obstacle was technical debt that was building up in the code base and causing us to make mistakes. So I wrote this tool that could detect high-risk changes in the code and let us know where we needed to do extra testing. But what I found wasn't what I expected at all, and that most of our mistakes were actually in the most well-written parts of the code. It wasn't in the crufty code that was full of technical debt. It was the code written by our most senior engineers. And at first, I didn't really know what to do with that. So I started digging around in the data. And what I did find was this, that we made significantly more mistakes in the code that we didn't write ourselves. So that made some sense in that you know, a lack of familiarity increasing the likelihood of mistakes. But I couldn't help but think there had to be more to the story than that. I mean, this is what I knew. When I had to work with complex code, it was really painful. But what made development actually feel painful? And so I started keeping track of my painful interaction with the code and visualizing it on a timeline like this. So the pain started when I ran into some unexpected behavior and ended when the problem was resolved. So this is five hours and 18 minutes of troubleshooting. Would all of you agree that's pretty painful? <laughs> so the amount of pain then was caused by two different factors, the likelihood of unexpected behavior and the cost to troubleshoot and repair the problems. And so if I wanted to understand the causes of these two things, I needed to kind of break them down into categories. And so that's kind of what I did. And what I realized as I was doing this is most of the pain was actually caused by human factors rather than problems in the code. So for example, stale memory mistakes. So this is when I have an idea in my head about how the uh, code is supposed to work, but it doesn't work that way anymore because somebody changed it. Or ambiguous clues. This is when you're running an experiment and there's multiple possibilities for how behavior can occur. You make a bad assumption and down the rabbit hole you go, troubleshooting for hours. So pain is a consequence of how we interact with the code. And these aren't really problems you know, with the code itself. So the way I started to think about it is pain occurs during the process of understanding and extending the software. And so I started optimizing for what I call idea flow, or this flow of ideas between the developer and the software, rather than optimizing the code itself. And I did that with the help of a data-driven feedback loop. So my team ended up spending tons of time working on improvements that didn't really make much difference for almost a year. And we had tons of automation, but the automation wasn't catching our bugs. And we had well-modularized code, but it was still extremely time-consuming to troubleshoot defects. And then we started asking, what are the specific problems that are causing the team's pain? And that's really when everything changed. And I learned one of the most valuable lessons of my career. The hard part isn't solving the problems, it's identifying the right problems to solve. So OpenDX measures this friction that occurs during a developer's experience. I'm measuring the friction in IdeaFlow. So digging into this, I, I notice there's this in rhythm to how we code. You know, we write a little code and work out the kinks and kind of do that over and again. Sometimes you've got bigger kinks, right? And what I noticed is there's kind of this decision point that occurs where we're validating the code, and if it does what we expect, we write a little more code. And if it doesn't do what we expect, we go down this troubleshooting path. And so I started tracking these progress loops and conflict loops as I was working. So with a progress loop, you can have learning that kind of gets in your way, that you're unfamiliar with something and you have to figure out how it works before you can go and make modifications. Or with a, a conflict, then you have to spend time troubleshooting and potentially reworking your solution to get back to a stable state. So these visualizations, I'm calling this an idea flow map, and all this stuff I'm calling friction in the timeline. And so I'm taking this data in, we're categorizing all the problems we run into with hashtags. It's nothing fancy, just we talk about what caused the pain in this case, basically anything over 20 minutes we talk about. And then we start adding up the pain by category to figure out what's the biggest problem that we're trying to solve or need to solve. So the way we're collecting this data is with tools that integrate with your IDE. They're partially automated, partially manual. And we're, we're working on rewriting the version we've been using the last two years right now. But right now, it's an IntelliJ plugin. So I'm going to show you that version. So um, on here. Um, so 
first thing we do is record an idea flow map. So Sorry, hold on. I pre-recorded this so I wouldn't have problems. <laughs> hmm. All right, so um, basically what I was going to show you, I'm not sure why this isn't playing, but it is playing and I just can't see it. Okay, well I'm gonna just have to look over there. We'll start over, sorry. Yay. Okay. So, um, first thing we do is uh, record an idea flow map, and this just makes a new idea flow map file. So, we'll call this you know, Gradle IFM demo. And then it's writing all the stuff out to files there. So, let's say the first thing we need to do is kind of learn how the system works. So, I'm basically going to hit the learning button and it asks you what question is in your head. And so, these are kind of like um, focusing questions. You can think Pomodoro technique ish. And so you'll be browsing around at different files and looking at things while you're trying to figure out how the system works. And then um, if you look at the file, it's basically spooling out all your editor activity and things to the IFM file. And then um, if you want to kind of start a subtask, basically tracking event notes so you can kind of chunk up different work and see what's going on. So we have a demo Gradle script here. And so let's pretend we're kind of a noob and we're going to kind of mess the script up a little bit. But this is a common error I see of, of um, uh, with, you know, first run at uh, attempts with Gradle. And, you know, we need, of course, another greeting task, right? <laughs> and then I'm going to test my script. And first it looks like everything's working fine, right? And then, uh-oh, that wasn't what I was expecting to happen. So this is that unexpected observation or conflict. And at that point, I'm just going to take a note about what the observation is. So I, I mean, if I have an error message, I might just cut paste the error message in here and ask, you know, why is this happening? Or something that helps you remember what that thing was that you ran into. And then I'll go back and troubleshoot the problem. And then you guys see what's wrong, right? Um, so we'll add in our little brackets here, and then test it again. And what I wanted you to see was essentially just the workflow. It kind of feels like you're just taking notes while you're coding. It's a little awkward at, at first, um, so we, we generally pair at first to kind of get used to it, but it's kind of like one of those not really a big deal thing after the fact. Um, and then basically putting in what, what the resolution is, what's for the conflict. And then, and then I'm basically coming up with um, kind of tags on the fly. Some of them we'll do after the fact. Some of them, you know, you'll just add in your comments. And, and uh, you, you, we start building this vocabulary of patterns of all the different types of problems we run into and things going wrong and, and refine kind of that system of categories over time. And then... Once we do that, you can open it up in a visualizer and you can see you know, the problem that you ran into here. And, and then if I go to file activity, the things that are edited are in blue so you can kind of see the detail of all the things that you did. And I'll show you an actual idea flow map here. So this was me working on trying to map the um, uh, existing, some existing Docker stuff that we had to the Docker plugin. And these are kind of real problems that you run into with bouncing back and forth between documentation and variable names being different or, you know, just little problems that you run into. And then, you know, eventually at the end, I, I ultimately decided it, it wasn't worth the effort and, and gave, gave up on it. And, I mean, this kind of stuff can happen a lot, but we never really hear about it, right? So, I mean, I'm sure... You guys have more exciting experiences than Hello World, but you kind of get the idea, right? So typical idea flow maps kind of look like this, where we've got learning at the beginning, you have some bumps along the way, and then a validation effort at the end. And then when you have uh, like a more um, complex uh, 
task with subtasks, it kind of breaks down into this like composite looking pattern. And what I started realizing is I was learning to read these visual indicators in the idea flow maps. And that, you know, it reminded me of kind of an EKG of how doctors use to diagnose uh, heart problems. Um, idea flow maps can help developers diagnose software problems. And what I was actually visualizing and recording was the problem solving process itself. And so I started doing a lot of cross-discipline research in kind of cognitive science and put together this model of, of uh, how we go through this problem solving process. So first we kind of choose a general strategy and we'll be evaluating alternatives. And then we kind of build a conceptual model of how the system works. And then we write some code and work out the kinks in this, in this validation cycle. And then sometimes we run into um, a, what I call strategy conflict, or you realize that your strategy isn't gonna work and you gotta go back to the drawing board. And then when we have, um, uh, we experience different symptoms based on where the friction is within the problem solving process. And so you get these very distinctive patterns. For example, this is what trial and error looks like. So the red is a, a strategy conflict, so that's when I realized my strategy wasn't gonna work. And then the blue is the time you, you spend coming up with a new strategy. And then um, yellow is the, is the time you spend kind of reworking things to get it back into, a, into um, you know, your plan B. And if you go through multiple trials, you get these multiple kind of stripes. And so um, and then I'm mapping this to various uh, risk models. So assumption risk drives the amount of rework we do. So assumption risk is driven by the likelihood of making a bad assumption and the cost to correct decisions. So things like bad assumptions about the architecture or design, bad assumptions about customer requirements, all those kind of things will like increase the size of those trial and error bands. Or uh, when there's problems with um, like struggling to understand the code, you get long swaths of learning time. And what these red bands are, so if you imagine you're trying to um, you know, figure something out and then you run into an unexpected dependency. Before you write any code at all, you've got to go chase something down that you weren't expecting to validate that it's not going to mess up your plan to get back on track again. So that's, we're kind of modeling these as like nested conflicts on top of a learning band. And so learning time is driven by familiarity risk or the likelihood of working with something unfamiliar and the cost to learn those things. So like things like having lots of third-party libraries, complex frameworks, a really large code base, a high turnover rate, you know, all of these things can cause extra learning work. So if you go and adopt some um, obscure framework that has a really high learning cost, you know, you have to take ownership of that cost on the team, especially if you can't hire people that have those skills. Or when you're struggling with getting feedback, which is, you know, a really common problem we run into, you get these big bands of troubleshooting time. So this one is driven by what I'm calling quality risk or that likelihood of unexpected behavior and the cost to troubleshoot and repair the problems. So friction is the time spent on troubleshooting, learning, and rework, which I'm mapping to quality risk, familiarity risk, and assumption risk to get a probabilistic model. So case studies. So um, one project I was working with, they had this um, huge mess with this, with this really great team, like all the original developers had left, but it was this old, you know, clunky project. And this is what it looks like when you're spending 90% of your time figuring out what to do and 10% of your time actually doing stuff. Like a lack of familiarity has this enormous impact on the amount of friction we experience. And the team had, um, you know, they were wanted to work on improvement, but they weren't sure what to work on because there were so many problems. So they said, okay, well, let's work on increasing unit test coverage by 5%. And then we started measuring the data, and these guys were spending around 700 hours per month generating test data for whatever tasks they were working on. But this didn't come up in their retrospectives at all. It was just, like, considered a normal part of the work that they didn't really think about until we started measuring how, how much time it was spent. But you know, once we knew what problem to solve, it was really hard to build tools that could help bring down this time tremendously. But until you know, it's right in front of you, 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 might, you might not notice it. Um, another case, so this is a, 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 a consulting gig I did where they, were, they had this 
big monolith application that they rewrote completely from scratch with microservices, continuous delivery, you know, whole, whole nine yards. And what really surprised me about this project was that after only 18 months, these guys were already spending, you know, over 50% over of their time troubleshooting problems. And they had this uh, architecture that, you know, looked good on paper. And then they distributed their architecture across their teams. And you know, once they did that, they had a, all of these problems with you know, integration hell mess and all the complexity kind of shifted up, up here. But you know, Conway's law effect, they were, they were stuck. And it, it was really hard to go and re-architect those boundaries across teams that didn't make sense. And of course, management said, well, we don't have time to fix any of this, right? You gotta keep, keep on trekking away at it. And so it was this classic story of project failure that you, know, you see over and over again in our industry where problems get deferred and then the builds start breaking and then releases get chaotic and productivity slows to a crawl and then developers start begging for time to work on improvements. But it's never enough and eventually you get to this point of project meltdown where everybody's exhausted and you have a mass exodus in your organization and everybody leaves, right? You guys familiar with this problem? So, I got on this project just as they were starting to get in the thrashing stage. And you could see this pattern that we always talk about of pain building up over time, but we've never really been able to see it. And so I don't have quite enough data to, to you know, put a chart together like this. So this is extrapolated from sample data, but these are some of the patterns you can see in these effects. So um, uh, learning is usually front loaded in the release as the team's kind of figuring out what to do. And then there's this rush before the deadline where validation is deferred and you get like this bubble of troubleshooting time. And then as pain builds, that baseline friction level keeps rising. And then eventually chaos reigns and the unpredictable work stops fitting in the time box. So I'm, I'm charting uh, capacity hours over time here. So even though all three of these releases were the same size, you can see that the team had to work almost twice as many hours to get that last release out the door. So we talk about technical debt as these interest payments, you know, building up over time and that, and that you know, it sounds like it's like 10 to 20% interest, right? But, you know, we're talking about 50, 70, 90% of our development capacity sometimes dealing with all this chaos and problems, but we're failing miserably to communicate what's going on to our management. This is the biggest cause of failure in our industry is that disconnect. And, um, you know, it's, we're trying to explain the problems in terms of increasing cost, but I think we need to start reframing things in terms of increased risk and, and quantifying that in a way that we can all get on the same page. I think the fundamental problem here is that pain doesn't show up on a balance sheet. And if, if we're running our company kind of by the numbers and looking at things from an investment perspective, it's really hard to quantify all this stuff because you know, we're looking at totally different things. And so we're, we're stuck in this pattern of disconnect. But what if we could get managers and developers all pulling the same direction? That would be pretty cool, right? So um, one of the things uh, we, we noticed um, in, in our code is you know, we had lots of friction in in brand new code. And this was really surprising at first. Um, I mean, we were thinking, you know, new code, it should be nice and shiny without problems, right? But this is how we came to, essentially, all of our problems are like upstream problems. We're dealing with challenges of upstream frameworks and learning unfamiliar tools. And, and you have all these challenges now that aren't in your code, but we're focused on, you know, the complexity and manageability of our code, not the challenges of using this gigantic infrastructure stuff, which is you know, our jobs these days. And so um, once I started looking at the problem this way, we started um, aggregating the, the data according to where it fit into the software supply chain. And I put together this kind of idea flow factory supply chain model so you could look at how, things, how these effects kind of um, affected different aspects in, uh, of the supply chain and kind of trickle downstream. But this gives us a way to optimize the rate of idea flow across any software supply chain, whether that be within our organization or across 
our industry. And I mean, it's, it's essentially the same model. As I mentioned, my background is in process control and supply chain optimization. So once I figured out how to do the metaphorical mapping, a lot of things just kind of click together. So one thing I want to note with how I'm, how I'm doing this, you know, typical manufacturing metaphor mapping, we have kind of build, test, deploy, and then you know, software goes to our customer. But the problem with looking at the manufacturing process this way, if you will, metaphorically, is that it focuses on short-term effects. And so we've got all this short-term optimization going on in our industry, and it's really hard to see you know, the long-term effects because it's, well, it's really hard to measure, right? So what I started doing instead was thinking about the software supply chain kind of as the factory floor and that developers are kind of operators making the components flow. So if you imagine the factory floor actually evolving over time, that's kind of how I'm doing this model. And so you can think about it, if, if you think about it that way, then things like cross-cutting architecture concerns become bottlenecks in the supply chain. Or lack of familiarity where you don't understand what's going on can, can back up other things from getting, getting changes then. And then this gives us a way to connect things like maintenance effort to revenue by tracking it through the software supply chain. So what I'm doing here is um, I'm basically breaking up um, uh, the, the costs according to um, feature pull by different customer segments. So um, I've got different customer segments polling in different areas and then I'm distributing the co cost um, by, by each customer segment and putting together um, throughput accounting me uh, metrics. So this uh, basically tracks the revenue for those customer segments to the, to the maintenance cost for all the poll related to that particular area. So the reason I'm calling this throughput accounting is in reference to um, Eli Goldratt's book, The Goal. Have any of you read the book? Okay. <laughs> Yay, okay, one. <laughs> um, but uh, essentially, it's about supply chain optimization in the manufacturing world. And uh, one of the things they talk about in the book is the huge uh, problems they had with uh, the traditional cost accounting metrics and how they needed to come up with a, a completely different method for um, managing profitability of, of a company that was based on throughput as opposed to just cost of tools and efficiency. And so once you start looking at data this way, you can start seeing things like this is our big Kahuna customer over here where, you know, um, sure we're getting lots of revenue from this customer, but is it really worth all the maintenance pain we're going through to get there? Or um, we can start to see, as opposed to just taking any deal on the table, we can start to see, you know, who are our most profitable customer segments that we want to go after as opposed to just, you know, taking anything. And, and when you're running a business, one of the things I've learned is, you know, when there's money on the table, it's really easy to grab it and, and not think about the implications, especially when the costs are so difficult to manage. And one of the big things we need to be able to do in our organizations is know when to say no. Um, and, and when all those costs are invisible, it's really hard to make good business decisions. So with OpenDX, we can start applying the entire suite of risk management tools from the lean manufacturing world to software development. So we can do statistical process control. We can do supply chain optimization. We can do throughput accounting. Like the entire model of tools just starts to work with this experience-based mapping. So I'm really excited about this. But because, you know, we have the power to start solving some of the biggest challenges in our industry with you know, redesigning these tools for, for um, uh, leadership and financial tools for our organizations. Because you know, we, can, we can wait for a lightning bolt to strike and business folks to figure this out, or we can figure it out ourselves and say, here's a new way to do this that will, that will make sense that you know, brings everybody together on the same page. So we have the power to solve this problem not that it will be easy, but we can do it if we choose to do it. And likewise, we have the power to solve this problem even at an industry level if we choose to do it. So as I see it, we've got two options. You know, we can stay the course with our dysfunctional organizations and growing snowball of usability problems, or we can build happiness, right? And that is what we do. 
Um, so I'm saying, you know, let's do this. But, you know, here's the catch, because there's always a catch, right? Is that in order for this to actually work, we have to start working together as a community. So one of the things I found in getting into this is it turns into a research problem really quick, where, where um, having knowledge and ideas and stuff from other people looking at this and asking questions makes all the world of difference in terms of reducing the cost it takes to learn from, from this data. So since I really care about getting these problems solved, what I decided to do about this is I started a organization this year specifically around this effort called Open Mastery. So this is a free to join industry peer mentorship network focused on data driven software mastery. And we are going to invent solutions for process control, supply chain optimization, throughput accounting for software organizations and build a community analytics platform that um, basically will have anonymized data that we can all study together solve problems together and start codifying our knowledge in terms of patterns and principles that are backed by data rather than just anecdote and gut feel, which has essentially been state of the art. So if you'd like to see our industry start collaborating on solving these problems and you're willing to give it a shot with respect to measuring your pain, then I encourage you to, to join us because as I mentioned, I mean, these are really hard problems and it's just really fun data too to, to, I mean, just look at it. It's fascinating. I've been studying this stuff for the last five years. And also just while we're here, let's talk about it. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a great opportunity. We've got like all kinds of awesome, you know, smart people here on, on just seeing how we, could, we can um, get some traction around um, solving these problems in our industry. That's all I got. Any questions? Um, in terms of noisy data, um, I, I, I can't disagree that, that basically what we've been doing is as we've run into um, um, specific challenges of how do we map this particular scenario, we've sort of worked those kind of things out as a team and I've started to, to um, come up with a set of, of rules around like what do I do in this case and that case. And, um, and I think that's part of the challenge of, of once it starts getting used in more context, figuring out what those rules are and actually defining a, a, a fleshed out standard. I think it, it just needs to evolve in, in the community to be, to, to work. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so was there any friction in getting the, getting the team on board with this? So um, I had some advantages because I'm the boss and I can tell them what to do. Um, but uh, uh, I've also, um, you know, that aside, um, it's, it's, um, d it's especially difficult to do on your own initially. Um, and, uh, and depending on... I think more automation will need to be done to, I mean, like more passive automation for, for it to be kind of a full-time thing. That said, um, uh, doing it periodically for a specific purpose, so what we've kind of been doing are, is, you know, gather data for a month and then use that to get a feel for where your problems are and then, and then do more um, spot-oriented. When I have a desire to learn about something that's going on, then I'll go and gather data on those specific things, but not necessarily do it on everything. And then, and then you've got passive data collection. But it's always there, so it's like, this is something I want to track. <laughs> and then you can, you can track that particular thing. Um, but um, I, I think that's probably the, the, the hardest, hardest part of, of this. Um, but uh, at least on my team, they said after a couple weeks it wasn't really a big deal anymore. 
Um, it, was, it was kind of like you know, just taking notes while you're working and, and found um, the, personally I found the, um, just clarifying the thought in your head into a, a, a question as, as kind of a forcing function is to be, is, 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 is a very focusing kind of thing to do. Like, you know, connecting all this stuff that isn't, it's, it's almost like pair programming, having to explain what you're doing in a sentence. And it, it forces a little bit of that into your, into your process. Sure. What's that? Yeah, I'd say I, the, I, probably the other big benefit, I've, I've used this in a context of mentorship, in that one of the things that's a big challenge in our industry is, you know, you teach people the, 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 the things you're supposed to do, like, you know, write unit tests, right? But there's a lot of finesse in terms of the art of what matters, and this makes it very goal-oriented, right, of, of like, we have this, this this goal of trying to figure out how to reduce reduce friction in our experiences, and so when when you do things that are counterproductive, so we ran into several cases where we refactored the code to make things more maintainable, and ended up having you know the opposite effect. You know, it was it was more modular and looked looked you know pretty from a metric standpoint, but it had usability um, issues from a um, troubleshooting and you know, making modification standpoint. And I, I don't think we, we've been really looking at problems that way because we've been so focused on optimizing the code. So it's, it's really been one eye-opening experience after another. Well, in that case, we talked about what was causing the problem and came up with another solution that was kind of a hybrid between the two. Different programming languages, different. So, um, so my team works primarily in in Groovy and then um, JavaScript and some Java, and then Gradle. Um, um, so, one of the things I've noticed is is like with um, uh, dynamically typed languages, specifically JavaScript, um, that the mistake frequency generally spikes in that you, tend, you, you move little things around and stuff breaks and, and you kind of have to just keep a tighter leash on the code than you do when you're in a statically typed language. And so you, you see those kinds of effects. Um, uh, I'd say probably the other kinds of things is that if you're, work, if you're using like a, a major uh, framework um, like uh, we tried to upgrade to Grails three, and undid that decision. <laughs> um, but uh, like learning curve on complex frameworks, especially ones that do lots of magic, um, can be crazy hard sometimes. And I, I think we kind of you know take for granted that you know when when we incorporate something that oh it's not our code it doesn't matter anymore even though you know you might spend hours and hours troubleshooting that one line of magic code so it really brings those kind of things to the surface especially with you know third party integration related things um Yeah, so specifically to that, what I've, what I've done is um, uh, the only way I think this will work is if the developers are doing it for themselves and not for somebody else. I mean, I think that's a really important aspect of it is, is we're trying to learn what's going on in our environment so we know what things to improve. And so what, what we've done is basically manage the problem upward. So we keep managers out of the data and then, and, then, um, and then compensate for that by building high visibility into the process. So we do visibility updates and add like a layer of sense making on top of the data before presenting it 
to management, and then you give them lots of visibility and stuff. So they, they uh, I think a lot of the, um, I, I want to measure stuff and figure out what's going on is driven by the lack of visibility and fear and uncertainty with respect to decision responsibility. And that dynamic really needs to shift in our organizations. Um, um, that, so I, I think having somebody that's responsible for uh, what I call a, a risk translator role of providing visibility, you can, you can kind of solve that problem with, um, with the, I want you to track your time and, and those kind of things. And, and also just, I mean, anonymize the data at that point. You can kind of aggregate things so, it's, so you're presenting, I mean, it's still the truth of what's going on. And then um, with respect to needs, I've, I've talked to managers who are like, well, how do I know who to fire? <laughs> Which is, is a real concern though, right? It's like, you know, if you've got dead weight on your team, how do you, how do you know what to do? And, and generally, if you, if you give somebody responsibility for mentoring the team, having that person also responsible for kind of calling the shots on when to let people go if, if, if they're you know, responsible for raising the bar of the team, then you've got somebody with both visibility and control making those um, decisions as opposed to somebody who, who doesn't know what's going on being responsible for that decision responsibility. So kind of creating more of a partnership relationship between management and developers. Yeah. Um, it's, it's available on, on GitHub, uh, uh, on Idea Flow tools. Um, but uh, the uh, plugin is just, uh, it's the one we've been using for the last couple of years to gather data. So what, what we're doing now is basically refactoring all the core logic behind a REST service that'll make it easy to port to any environment and turning it into more of a, a platform. So it's, it's, it's pretty clunky right now. But, you know, it's a work in progress, right? And that's what happens when you work nights and weekends on things, right? It, it, it takes time. All right, uh, well thank you.